Hey folks, welcome back to another Throat Punch Lunch. Happy holidays, and I do mean that in the most sincerest, kindest way possible. I know that this is a rough time of the year for some people, and I and for that I do apologize, and I certainly hope that uh, there has been some influx of warmth and cheer and joy uh, in this uh, time. But I, with the happy holidays, I sincerely mean Merry Christmas and I hope you have a happy new year. Now, with all that being said, I have a great uh, lineup, a little bit of a shorter episode this week, but that's to be expected, right? Just people are busy doing holiday things. And so uh, we do have a good lineup of contributors this week, and and, and I hope that you enjoy uh, the segments as much as I did putting them together. So without further ado, you are here for my contributors. You're not here to see me blather on, so... Here we go. 2016 has been a great year for new games. Whether you like Euros, Ameritrash, or something in between, there's a game for you. Personally, I found a lot that I really like, and since this segment has focused on thematic games, I'll give you my top three thematic games of 2016 in this installment of Face Up, Center of the Table. I had a tough time narrowing down my list, so I had to come up with criteria to help me flesh out the top three. My top thematic games had to be ones where I was so engrossed in the theme and the experience that the mechanics of the games were just washed away. They were only there to help move the story forward without distracting from the gameplay. With that in mind, I was able to whittle the list down to three. So let's get started. Number three. Wait, what, what's going on? You're telling me that we've already blown through our annual budget for animation and graphics? And I, I guess props too? You, you guys blew all your money on Star Wars Destiny boosters, didn't you? You're so weak. Coming in at number three is Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition. I was not a fan of the first edition of this game, and this was mainly due to the complexity of the setup and the amount of time it took for the Keeper to get through their turn. Well, with the introduction of the Game Managing app, 2nd Edition addresses both of those issues. Setup is now a breeze because the app tells you what items to distribute among the characters, what starting map tiles are on the table, and what items are on those tiles. Now you can jump right into the game with the app narrating the game, managing the monsters, and the maps. This helps keep the gameplay very fluid and allows the players to get invested in their characters and the story without getting bogged down by the game's mechanics. Number 2 Coming in at number two is Star Wars Rebellion. I bought this game mainly because I thought the mechanics sounded fun and the Star Wars theme was just a bonus. However, I was totally surprised on how well the theme was integrated into the game. When playing as the Empire, you control a massive fleet, searching the galaxy for a hidden rebel base. Meanwhile, the rebels try to keep their base hidden by thinning out the Empire forces if they get close or by bluffing and sending the Empire on a wild goose chase. It's an epic game of cat and mouse that is brought to life by playing the iconic characters we all know and love, plus managing the really cool ships and vehicles of the Star Wars universe. The Force is strong in this one. Number one! As a fan of many of the Fantasy Flight Living card games, when they teased an LCG game that had RPG elements, I was skeptical. But they pulled it off, which is why Arkham Horror, the card game, is my number one thematic game of the year. In this game, you construct a character deck that will change as you play through scenarios of the campaign. You can then spend earned XP to upgrade your cards, or you might have to add weakness cards in your deck that hinders you. Regardless, you become attached to this character as you play through the story. The location cards used in each scenario creates a map that allows you to explore, gather clues, and fight monsters. Unlike the Lord of the Rings LCG, which has specific phases for player actions, on your turn you can do whatever you want. You can collect resources, draw cards, attach equipment, attack, and search for clues. The open-endedness of the player turns gives it more of a role-playing feel which makes it feel even more like you're playing a character and not playing a game. Since this is an LCG, it will be hitting my table for years to come, and I can't wait to see where FFG takes it. Mmm. Mmm. Oh my gosh, that's not tea. We ran out of money for making tea. What, what did I just drink? 
You don't know? Oh, I'm going to be sick. All right, fine, fine. Everybody just get set for the last scene. We just ran out of money for video editing. We can't edit any of this part out. Unbelievable. Fine. So that's my top three thematic games of 2016, but I'm already looking forward to what 2017 will bring. What are your top thematic games of 2016? Let me know in the comments. Okay, wow, I'm really glad we are able to get through that before we ran out of Hi, this is Ambi from Board Game Blitz, and this is Strategically Thematic, a new segment where I talk about theme in different strategic games. This time, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite games, Dungeon Pets. Dungeon Pets is a worker placement Euro game where you're a pet store owner raising these cute little monsters to sell to the dungeon lords. Basically, it's kind of like a Tamagotchi board game. You need to take care of your pets by feeding them, playing with them, and cleaning up their poop. There are quite a few complex mechanics in Dungeon Pets, but because the theme shines through so well, the mechanics make a lot of sense when you actually start playing the game. For example, in the main worker placement mechanism, you put your imps into groups and send them to the market to buy the things that you need, like food or cages and of course the pets. There are some rules on which spaces you can go to, but the rules are explained thematically. For example, when you buy a pet, you also need to bring at least one gold since you need to pay for it. When you get a cage, you need at least two imps in your group since cages are heavy and one imp can't carry it by himself. But my favorite part of the game is the needs cards. In the game, you'll have a hand of these different colored needs cards, and you'll draw and play them based on the colors shown on the pets that you own. Depending on what cards are played for your pet, you have to do different things to satisfy their needs. Green cards are generally about hunger, so there's a lot of food and poop. Yellow are for playing, red are anger needs, and purple are magic. Each pet has a different personality shown by the colors, and that determines what the pet wants that day. Here's a pet that really likes eating, so you'll want to get a lot of food to prepare for him. And this one is playful, and you'll have to make sure you play with it. And when you don't satisfy the pet's needs, they get sad and suffer, which makes them not as attractive to the customers, so you won't get as many points. The needs cards are also used to determine how well the pet score in exhibitions and which dungeon lords you sell the pets to. And those are the main ways you get points in the game. This dungeon lord wants a playful pet that's not angry, so this pet here would be perfect for it. Dungeon Pets has a lot of strategy, since you need to plan ahead all the time. You can see which customers and exhibitions will be coming up in future rounds, so you need to decide which pets to buy and which need cards you'll want to play. But in addition to the strategy, the theme shows everywhere in the game, from the cute, detailed art to all the mechanics. The blend of strategy and theme makes Dungeon Pets one of my favorite games. Thanks for watching Strategically Thematic. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Hey everyone, this is Tim Jeanette at the Metal Meeple, and this is the Miniature Breakdown. For the past handful of episodes, I've been showing you different modeling techniques with different models and such. And the whole intent was I was going to do all this to my Arena Rex models so that when I had this video, I could have all them prepared in the same manner. Now that didn't happen, but I'm still going to show you Arena Rex anyway. Now Arena Rex is a small skirmish game where you play about three to five, maybe three to six models on each team. Let me show you the right side of the box here. These are the two factions that I purchased. Each one comes with three models and their stat cards and some tokens. I purchased the rule book separately, although you can download the rules portion of it from their website. Half this book is fluff. The game is kind of a uh, Roman game that takes place in a Colosseum, and it's a very brutal game where you basically fight to the death, right? And let me show you some of the models. You got both set factions here, left and right. You got all the tokens. These tokens are exhaustion markers or fatigue markers. Uh, as you take actions with your guys, you're going to mark next to them that you've done something. On your turn, basically, you do one action. Uh, you can or you activate one model, and that model can't have a fatigue token on it. 
the first thing you can do is move and it's free, but then after that, if you attack and you can attack again, or you can move up to three times if you want, but each additional action will give you a fatigue marker. And if you get a second one, they become exhausted. And that's what this little uh, circle with the X or line through it is. The other side is just a flat side. Uh, the, 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 the given pull of that is you don't want to go and exhaust all your models because then you don't get to do anything on your next turn except for clear them off basically. So let me show you some of the cards. The, the, the meat and potatoes of this game is this and the damage system. Now everything in the game is six sided dice and a four plus on any die is called a success. And everything you do is going to be successes minus the opponent's successes and then you have a net gain so, or a net effect. So. If you're gonna attack somebody, right, he's got a attack of six. So he's gonna roll six dice, and then whatever amount of successes he has, and there's some favor things you can add that will give you extra successes, but the, you know, say he's attacking himself, he's only gonna roll two dice for defense. So say, you know, after he rolls, he gets five successes minus one, uh, you know, success, then there's a, he's doing four damage. Now, this damage grid right here is what you get to do to the opponent. You start off on the top and you go down following the line. So you can start off in this two, or you can start off on push. So say you do push, three, push, push. The reason you might wanna do that is because each push allows you to actually move a, a miniature one inch and then follow up to them. One inch and then follow up to them. The reason you might wanna do this is because there could be terrain features around, such as pit traps where you can push them in and they'll die, or columns that you can push them in and actually do extra damage on them. And so you can see that the game's pretty brutal. If you got max damage on this guy, so even if you got more than five successes, you know, you get the max here. You got two, three, which is five. All the special abilities are one. There's other special abilities uh, on other characters, but this guy just has pushes. So three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. He does eleven damage. You can see the damage grid down here. The skull. Uh, these little uh, favor tokens. When they're marked off, they give you favor points. But you got five, ten. He only has fourteen hit points, so he can almost kill himself in one hit. That's how brutal this game is. Now on the back you do have different abilities, uh, and he has one that where if he dies, uh, this model makes an attack. So all the models have different unique abilities and such. You pick a faction, you pick your guys for it, and you can you can off faction guys uh, depending on how many you have. It's a percentage, or you can at least have in a uh, three model game. I think you can have one maybe. I don't remember. Anyway, so for the most part, you're picking a faction. Uh, the coolest thing about this game is the damage system. It is incredible. The Just the way it acts, you know, you roll and you do this do this, this grid. If you're near something, you're like, maybe I want to try to push him over to that. It's just, it's incredible. So highly recommend it. The models are a little hard to put together. They're a little thin, but if you are into miniature games, this is definitely one you should be uh, having on your radar. It's very quick and awesome. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me at timjanet at gmail.com. And until uh, next time, keep on rocking and rolling dice. And Happy New Year! Welcome to Counter Charge here on Throat Punch Lunch. Today we're going to be talking about Bin Fa, a game of oriental strategy. This is an abstract war game. It's pretty cool. In the old days when it was originally released, it only had a hexagon board and it was static. Now you can move the board around into different uh, configurations, which increases the cool factor a little bit. So why don't we go ahead and go to the close cam and check it out. All right, now this is a game of Bin Fa. This is a two player game that's set up with each player only having one army. Now it can play up to six players, two to six players with each player taking a different army color. Uh, if you play with two players, you could actually have uh, the players take three armies each if you want. So there's different ways to play from that standpoint. Also, in the original version, this hexagon map, it was a hexagon map. But now you can actually move it and you can make the board change, which changes the tactical options, okay, which is a neat aspect to the game now. These black chips right here that are on the board, those represent blocking terrain. You can think of them as mountains or rivers or something. The white ones are vortexes, all right? Uh, your army units, each player gets 12 armies which are just these uh, checkers, and then your general is a pawn, all right? 
Your supply marker are the bishops that run on the supply track on the outside. Now, your typical turn uh, consists of either two things. You go for supplies or you go to move your army units. So why don't we go ahead and let's say the purple player is going to move for supplies. So you roll the dice and you can either move two, three, or five spaces along the supply track to try to gather supplies. So I can go one, two, I can go one, two, three, or I can go one, two, three, four, five. Okay? Now, he's purple, he's landing on a yellow space. I do not control the yellow sector, and I didn't land on a purple space, so I would collect no supplies during that turn. Okay? Now, how you move. Let's, you roll the dice after playing a supply token, and you move the difference between the two dice. So in this case, a two and a one, so I get one move. Okay? So let's say it's the green player's turn. They're going to move over there after they paid a supply token. Okay? So as you can see, the green player has lots of supply tokens, so he can go ahead and choose to move again. So he pays a supply token, and he rolls a six and a four, so he can move two spaces. Okay, so he goes ahead and decides to move one, two, and he'll go ahead and pay another supply. And this time a four and a two, so he gets to move two spaces. One, two. Okay, so you get the ideas. Now, how you go ahead and defeat units in this game is that you have to surround them. So in this case, if I had an army unit here, here, and here, you cannot move across the points of the triangles, so this unit would be surrounded and eliminated. Each player plays until they have either four army chips left or two chips in a general. Once you go below that level, you've surrendered your army. All right, folks, so that has been Fa. Pretty interesting, you know. I mean, if you like abstracts and, uh, you know, it's supposed to be a war game, it kind of plays a little bit like a war game, but in a way, it's not a war game, so it's a lot of fun. You can check that out. Like I said, if you're interested in getting a copy, you want to go to binfa.com, and uh, you can check it out over there, and that's probably the best place to get it is picking it up over there on the website. So I hope you enjoyed this. Next time we get together, we're going to be talking about Kings of War International Campaign Day, which is coming at you January 14th, 2017. <laughs>this is Roy Candy from Epic Gaming Night and this is Roll With The Punches. Since this is the end of the year and this is a segment all about randomness in games, I thought I'd make a end of the year ode to all of you dice chuckers out there. Check it out. I know sometimes you might feel like you're down on your luck or things aren't maybe working out for you the way that you want, but hopefully things will all swing back around and the odds will even out into your favor. I hope you guys have an amazing 2017. 2016 has been a crazy interesting year for all of us and I'm super excited to see what the future holds. So thanks so much for checking out Roll With The Punches. You guys are amazing. I hope in the coming year your dice always roll high and you have a great time playing games. We'll see you then. Hey folks, welcome to our first segment of Just Missed It here on Throat Punch Lunch. Now, the idea behind this segment is going to be I'll talk about a game or a number of games that just missed something. Whether it was inclusion in this list or inclusion in that or uh, it could even be it just missed being a good game because it didn't do this or whatever it might be. Now this year I was able to do my top 100 games of all time and because of having to do it at a certain time and get it done by a certain time, 
I wasn't able to play some of the games that I thought maybe probably could have possibly uh, had a chance at making my top 100 games of the of, of all time. Number five is a game called Hold the Line by Worthington Games, and it's also published by PSC Games uh, in Britain. Now, the gameplay is very similar to that of a Memoir 44 or a Battle Cry or a Command of Colors Ancients or something to that effect, with the caveat being that we don't have any cards and we don't have the three divisions of play or anything like that. So it's different from the Memoir 44 system, the Command of Colors system. However, it gives you the same feel. Now, the component quality is not as good as it probably could be, but the gameplay is where it's at, I think, which is why it possibly could have made my top 100. My number four is the Arrival by Martin Wallace. Now, I'm not a big, huge Martin Wallace fan because he usually makes games that are way too complex and difficult for me to enjoy. I can play them, don't get me wrong, I just don't have fun doing it. The Arrival, though, is a mid-weight, family-level style game where each of the ancient Irish chieftains are trying to fight back uh, against a horde of Fomori that are invading the ancient Isle of Ireland. And it is very simple in its gameplay, has a lot of really interesting mechanics in it as far as programming what you're going to be able to do and the resources that you're going to have during your turn. And I've really enjoyed playing this so far. This probably had a pretty good shot of making my top 100. I just didn't play it in time. Raise Your Goblets is a game that we actually got at Essen. And Eric Summer and I actually sat down and played a two-player version of it, but I was not very happy with the two-player version of it. So it kind of took the back shelf for a while. And then here recently, I pulled it out, and we've been able to play some more multiplayer games of it, you know, uh, up on up to six players, and I really enjoy it. I'm confident this would have made my top 100 somewhere had I played it in time and not just that two-player version of it. This little bad boy would have definitely made my top 100. Where exactly, I don't exactly know, but this would have definitely fallen within my top 100 this year had I played it in time. Uh, it was being demoed all the way back at Gen Con. I watched it being played. I saw, saw the miniatures, saw the components. I was very taken aback, but we just didn't get a copy in for the longest time. And uh, we were just able to play it uh, here recently a few, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, really enjoyed it. Now, this big fella would have definitely made my top 100 list. It probably would have made the top 50 uh, if not even higher than that. And uh, I just really enjoyed a lot of the mechanics of the game, uh, which overshadowed some of the other nitpicks that I had with the game. Now, of course, artwork is one of those nitpicks that I had with the game. I thought they went over the top on one of the characters. They could have done without that. And it still have been a perfectly legitimate game. Um, but the mechanics are what really pulled it through for me. It's, it's probably the best Conan game that's out there at this point. Uh, I've played the others, uh, the other one, uh, that I have still, um, uh, right down there, the Age of Hyboria, and, uh, this one is much better. Uh, scenario driven, no campaigns or anything like that, but you could do it if you wanted to. Really enjoy the game, I think it's high on my list, probably should be high on yours as well, if you like these kinds of games. So that's it for Just Missed It, uh, this week, I think. If you have any ideas on, on different topics I could hit next time or following episodes, please let me know in the comments below. And until next time, we'll see you on the flip side. Cheese, I'm Forrest from Bowers Game Corner, and I'm back again for three reasons where I do something vaguely related to the number three. I am once again continuing on my year end 2016 bonanza thing, and this time I'm going to be talking about my top three games of 2016, which were Vast the Crystal Caverns, Scythe, and Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition. But then I realized that was kind of lame, because you all know about those games, everybody's talked ad nauseum about those games, so instead I'm going to be giving you three of my favorite games from this past year. They were all in my top 10 games of 2016 that I think might slip beneath the cracks and that you might not have heard of and hopefully you can go check them out now. So starting off, number three, I have Witch Hunt from Kyle 
Brockman. This is a large group social deduction game, and I don't say this lightly, but this is a werewolf killer. Werewolf is in my top 20 games of all time. I love werewolf, but with a good moderator, witch hunt is just better. It fixes everything that you don't like about werewolf. Player elimination, there's still player elimination, but now you actually have a small but kind of important role after you die. Oh, I'm a villager, woo-hoo. Well, nobody's a villager in witch hunt. Everybody has their own unique role each and every time, and those roles aren't fixed. So you might have that role as a good guy one time and as a bad guy another time. I love witch hunt, check that one out. Number two, I have from Albino Dragon Games, of all companies, the Goonies Adventure Card Game. And I was shocked to find out that this is still not getting much buzz. I really enjoy this cooperative game based on the Goonies, where you are trying to find gems and go through the Goonies storyline by going to various different locations. The theme kind of is a little bit wobbly, but the gameplay itself is rock solid. It is a fantastic family weight cooperative game that is like a big moving puzzle that you try to figure out. I really liked it an awful lot, and, and I hope I hope it gets some buzz too so we can see some expansions in the future. Lots of variabilities can be very difficult. One that I highly recommend, that's the Goonies Adventure Card Game. But my number one game of 2016 that I worry might slip between the cracks is Battle Goats from Cardboards. I got this game in the mail I think in like September, and I wasn't expecting much. And since then, I've probably played it 20 to 30 times. It just keeps hitting the table. It is a very simple tuck box game for two to six players in which you are going to form a three by three battlefield of battle goats. Yeah, the theme's kind of weird. But what makes this game amazing is the fact that each and every card in this game is different and interacts differently. And it just has so much variety and variability. You can play it as a team game. It's not in the rules, but you can do it quite easily. And it just keeps getting played. Small little tuck box, tons of game though. Highly recommend Battle Goats from Card Lords. But those are the three games that I worry might slip through the cracks from 2016. Let me know in the comments below. Are there any games that are hidden gems for you from 2016? Let me know about them in the comments below. And as always, back to more Throat Punch goodness. Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson with Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here to bring you another episode of Solo Thrash, a mere thrash gaming for those of us who like to play alone. Today I want to talk about one of my favorite deck builders. It's a lot of game in a little box, and it's Star Realms, which happens to have a couple of very interesting solo variants. Star Realms is a very typical deck builder in the sense that all players begin with the same starting deck. So whether you're playing solo or with two players, you're going to begin your game with a mixture of scouts that are worth currency and vipers, which are worth combat points. So you use your scouts or other currency cards that you acquire to purchase cards off of this in a row. Um, and you use your combat points to reduce your enemy's authority or any bases that they might acquire. So some of these cards are bases that they can use to defend themselves from your attack. The ultimate goal of the game is to reduce your enemy's authority, which is represented by the green shields up there in the left corner, to zero. So unlike a lot of deck builders, there's a bit of a combat element to it. If you want to play one of the solo scenarios, um, there are a few that have been published for the game. The ones that I have experience with come from an expansion called Gambit. There's actually a second expansion called Cosmic Gambit, but you don't want that one. You want plain Gambit for the solo game. So one of the scenarios for that one is Nemesis Beast. As you can see, there's a sort of AI that directs the game. So for each turn, you take off one of the cards from the, um, the center row, the one that's furthest from the draw deck. You draw a new card, and whatever faction symbol is on the card you draw, that is what determines the action that Nemesis Beast will take against you. There is also another solo scenario in the pack called Pirates of the Dark Star, and they're both a pretty good time. In Star Realms, there are four different factions that will help you determine your strategy. So you have the Trade Federation, the Star Empire, the Machine Cult, and the Blob Society. Uh, but anyway, each of these different factions has different abilities, and if you play them in combination with other cards from the same faction, you get bonuses. So, for example, if I played two blob ships from my hand, I would be able to acquire any ship without paying its cost and then put it on top of my deck. Um, so it definitely pays off to try to create a strategy where you have multiple cards from the same faction. Of course, that may not be possible because there's a randomization effect because you're drawing off of a, of a draw deck. 
So a lot of the game is trying to make decisions that will help you later in the game without necessarily knowing what's going to show up next. If you ask me to tell you what my favorite board game was, I might not think to name Star Realms. But if you were trying to determine what my favorite board game was by looking at what games I play the most, Star Realms would definitely be up there. It's just one of those games that I return to again and again. As a solo player, I really enjoy it as a light game to use to while away an evening. It's easy to set up, it's easy to take down, it has a small footprint, and you can play multiple games in the same night. Um, it's also a really good game for couples. It's one of the few games that my boyfriend will play with me repeatedly. Actually, every time we go to a coffee shop, we take it with us so you can see the corners start to get dinged up from being in my bag. And to me, that's really great. You know, we, we never just play one game. We'll finish one game and one of us will be like, oh, you want to go again? And to me, that's the mark of a game that's really worth investing in. Um, the expansions also add enough variety to add a little bit of extra fun once you've played the base game enough times. And honestly, I really can't recommend Star Realms enough. Um, it's a lot of game in a small package, and I I really appreciate playing it, both as a solo player and as part of a couple. So I highly recommend it, and I'll see you gamers next week. Welcome back to Jedi Mind Games. My name's Kodai, and today I want to talk about the different lists that I've seen people run, and it's been pretty powerful in my opinion. So you might see these if you go to your local tournament, so I want you guys to be prepared for them. So the first one I want to talk about is the Han Solo and Rey deck. Now that one's pretty popular because Rey allows you to cheat the game. Normally the game goes, I take an action, and you take an action. Whenever you can break that, that's amazing. Rey has a built-in ability where... After you play an upgrade on this character, you may take one additional action. That's already fantastic enough. But then they made a card called Holdout Blaster. Holdout Blaster is an interesting card because it has, because it has Ambush on it. And what Ambush allows you to do is take another action. So if you put a Holdout Blaster on Ray, then you get two actions. That's insane. <laughs> That's two actions where you get to do whatever you want. Normally, what you're going to do is you're going to equip the Holdout Blaster on Ray. And then you get two actions to do something. So you might activate Han. You might activate Rey on the same turn. That's great. You might play other cards as well. So it's all good. What's really neat is for every ambush card you play, Han Solo gets one shield. So that makes Han pretty tanky for the most part. You can combine that with different cards like I think it's called Repost. And that allows you to remove the shields you've built up on Han to deal damage to your opponent. So... When Han, when Han and Rey get a bunch of cards like Jetpack and Holdout Blasters and, you know, the 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 Han Solo gun. I forget the name of it. It's going to be right here. Yeah, the name of the card's right here. So whenever they get all, that all together, it's a ton of ranged damage. It's crazy. So you might be asking yourselves, how do you beat this deck? Well, it's a little tough because they get to do a ton of actions before you do. So my recommendation is to try and kill Rey as quickly as possible. Because she is the one that allows this deck to cheat and cheat and cheat over and over again. And you do not want you do want not want that to happen. You want to kill Rey as quickly as possible. And if you ever see yourself in a situation where you can kill Han Solo pretty quickly, like in within that same turn, I would say also go for that. But mainly you should probably focus on Rey. Rey is Rey is definitely the threat of this deck. So the second deck I want to talk about is the Blue Villains, because the Blue Villains get a really, really powerful card called Sith Holocron. Now this card allows you, allows you to cheat in a different way, unlike the Han Rey deck. This one allows you to ramp into very, very powerful blue abilities. So the Sith Holocron, when you land that special, it allows you to switch the Sith Holocron with a blue ability from your hand, and you may spend one resource to uh, roll its die into your pool. So it allows your mind throw, your, not mind throw, your force throw and your mind probe to be active immediately. That's crazy. So if you combine these with the power of the force and no mercy, then you're in for one, one heck of a time because that's going to be a ton of damage coming towards your opponent. Some of the popular blue villain characters that I think you're going to see a lot are Count Dooku and Vader. Uh, Vader is normally paired up with the Raider, so the Tusken Raider. And you'll see Sith Holocron be put on the Raider and just 
try and cheat out a bunch of great, great stuff on the on the Raider. And Vader's just a monster by himself. Count Dooku is pretty pretty good in my opinion. He doesn't look like much just looking at his his dice and looking at his ability at first hand. But when you see he has 10 health, that's actually a lie. He does not have 10 health. He has more in line of like 12 to 15 maybe, depending on how much you discard. So his ability states, before this character is dealt one or more damage, you may discard a card from your hand to give him one shield. So if your opponent resolves dice one at a time, which they have to if it, there's, if it doesn't show on a modified side. So let's say you, the opponent has a one, a one range and a two range uh, showing on their field, and they resolve range damage. So what's going to happen is they're going to resolve the two damage one on you, and you can discard a card. Okay, great. And get a shield, and you take one. And then they're going to end up resolving that other range damage, and they're going to hit you, and you're just going to discard another card, and you negate that with that shield. That's pretty tanky. Count Dooku is going to be annoying to kill, because you're not going to go for him first, because there's probably other characters that are more threatening. By the time you get to Count Dooku, he's going to be a monster, because I'm sure at that point you upgraded him with lightsabers or mind probes and stuff like that he's going to be quite the force to deal with so how do you go ahead and beat count dooku well if you get the modified sides on your dice to activate with your uh your regular damage then that's the way to beat him so for example if you roll a two range and a plus three range modifier modifier you should be you should be good to go because that's going to hit for five and he can only discard one card for one shield so you're pushing four damage that turn that's pretty good that's probably the best way to beat him, which is modified damage. All right, guys, that's what I got for you this week. I hope you guys learned a little something. And if you have any questions, please be sure to put them in the comments below, and I will be sure to answer them. If you want to find out more about Board Game Essentials, go to youtube.com slash boardgameessentials. All right, guys, with that, enjoy the rest of your lunch. All right, take care. Hello everyone, it's Jeremiah Acevedo, the Board Game Renegade, and I just want to wish you all a Merry Christmas and a safe and happy New Year. And guess what? You guys get to witness something awesome. My sister got me a gift for Christmas and she said I could open it during one of my videos because she wants to see my reaction. So she knows I love games and uh, I think I know what it is. Pandemic Iberia, yes! <laughs> Anyway, I'm pretty sure she got it for me because uh, I've been talking about it a lot. So in advance, sis, thank you very much for the Moncala. And so that is that. Again, I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I sincerely hope that you will find happiness and joy in some way during this upcoming season and year. Don't forget that we are starting our new Indiegogo fundraiser campaign uh, next month and uh, stay tuned to the channel for updates on that uh i know tom did a q a this week that uh he gives some information about getting an alert email when when that uh fundraiser goes live so go back and watch that q a that he did on monday i believe so uh without further ado let's go ahead and get on out of here thanks so much for joining us we'll see you guys on the flip side Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.